Please forgive me guys, I've got a bit of a throat infection this week. The Town That Dreaded Sundown. That's just an awesome name for a movie. It's like an ominous title for a western, but it works just as well for this hard-hitting slasher. It's based on the Texarkana Moonlight Murders, a series of attacks that resulted in five deaths in the spring of 1946. The attacker was dubbed the Phantom Killer. This murderer wore what is believed to be a white bag or pillowcase with eyes cut out over his head and sent the town into a panic. And, despite a large investigation, the killer was never caught. In 1976, a movie was made loosely based around the crimes. It got a lot of flack for its tagline which read, In 1946, this man killed five people. Today, he still lurks the streets of Texarkana. That is really insensitive. It's a dated and low budget offering, but atmospheric. And even to this day, it's played every Halloween in the town. But I'm not here to talk about the original, I'm here to talk about the remake. Then again, remake might not be the best word to describe this film. The movie is actually based in our world, where the first movie exists, and now there's a copycat killer in modern times murdering people based on sequences from the 1976 film. It even opens with a kind of mini documentary explaining the original crimes, the release of the first movie, and then transitions us to the modern day where the film takes place. It's an excellent way to do a remake, kind of a meta sequel that allows you to cover the same ground while also doing something new at the same time. The film's best feature by far is its visual style. Not only is the cinematography sparklingly gloomy, but no matter what scene it is, there's always some distinct flair to the image to make it stand out. The film is dominated by an orange-yellow tint, but the colours really pop on screen. It doesn't always fit, but the camera is either fluid in motion, tilted at a weird angle, fastly chasing someone, or just whipping around everywhere constantly. Combined with the ultra-slick editing, and you have one hell of a voguish look. It's like an editor's fever dream. Whenever the killer appears, the film becomes a whole new beast. It's so chaotic, fast cut, and the camera shots seemingly randomly picked that it instantly makes you panic a little, just like the people being chased. There was a lot of moments in the film that I just sat back and marveled at the imaginative camera work. They really went out of their way to ensure these chases and murder scenes were bursting with energy. It really captures the carnage of a murder, and luckily, there's a ton to see. You, turn around. Do not look back. <laughs> right, if, if, if you want money, I can get you money. I don't want money. What do you want? I said don't look back. The killer is really good. He's not played under cliches or with a big personality. They treat him as a seriously real killer. It makes the moments where he does go a little over the top, like with the infamous trombone scene, all the more chilling, as it's clear there's a perverted sexual motive to his crimes from the outlet. Then there's the sound. The soundtrack is fantastic. It's strange, distinct, and it sets the mood perfectly for every scene. For as great as the audio-visual experience is, the story is where the film just isn't up to par. The issue is that it doesn't alternate the editing style when it comes time to let the audience take in the story elements. While the aggressive editing and barn burner camera work might work excellently with the action, when it comes time to tell the narrative, it means information just whizzes by so quickly that we're given no time to really digest what's going on. He's the only place I've ever known. Mayor's asked us to hold I mean, Jesus, how many edits was that just for people sitting down to a town meeting? Aside from the style, it's just your run-of-the-mill slasher flick. It's very difficult to explain, but the film is very flowy. It's as if there's an invisible wall between you and the experience that prevent you from becoming invested in the events unfolding. And I think a lot of that has to do with how fast the film just rushes to get you to the next killing scene. It seems all the focus was on how they were going to make the film visibly striking that the writing was, unfortunately, left behind. If it just took a breath when it needed to, it would have been much better off for it. It's such an awkward feeling. I can follow what's going on, but as an audience I felt oddly disconnected from what was going on on screen. Two dozen times, right next to the tracks. My daddy 
He had a theory about that. It also changes the ending, and in my opinion, not for the better. The ending was my favourite bit of the original. I will give it credit, they do give the victims much more of a backstory in this one. For instance, the two lovers that are attacked with the trombone are two boys thinking about experimenting sexually with one another. Little things like that go a long way in leaving a bigger impact. Oh, and the trombone scene is still legendary. I love that the killer can't play it properly, it just makes it even more creepy. <laughs> The Town That Dreaded Sundown is a massive case of style over substance, and if you're a fan of visual flamboyance, it's easy to recommend. But if you find a good story more entertaining than how a film looks, then aside from some tension-filled kill scenes, this probably isn't for you.